My name's uh, Ben Chu, as you all know, if, if anyone's watching on uh, WebEx. I'm one of the uh, endo-urologists here. Dirk Lang and I are going to talk today about systemic manifestations of kidney stone disease. I'm going to basically take the jumping off point that we looked at erectile dysfunction and coronary artery disease, and a few years ago this sort of happened where this transition was that erectile dysfunction wasn't just a, a urologic entity on its own, it was actually uh, signifying something else greater, and that's that the penile arteries can actually be a canary of the body. If you start to block off these smaller arteries, then you could be in trouble because you could have problems with coronaries and your carotid arteries as well. And studies have shown that patients who do have coronary artery disease usually get predisposed erectile dysfunction. And on average, erectile dysfunction predates their coronary artery symptoms by about three years. So after this, there was a big change. We weren't just suddenly doling out PDE5 inhibitors. We were uh, taking blood pressures, recommending to, to patients to have their lipids done and uh, looking at stress tests and, and getting more involved as, a, as an overall physician and, and looking at the patient in, in, a, in a broader sense. So the take home messages from today and in this same kind of vein that erectile dysfunction to coronary artery disease, we're gonna to take towards stones because stones are associated with metabolic syndrome. There's really good evidence uh, to prove this now. I'm also gonna talk about how shockwave lithotripsy, at least at our center, does not cause diabetes or hypertension as we've looked at our data. The DASH diet or dietary approaches to stop hypertension is also good for preventing kidney stones as well as preventing hypertension. Basically treat the whole patient, not just the stone. And then Dirk is going to come and talk about, Dirk is a microbiologist at PhD, he's going to talk about gut bacteria and how it may be a key factor in stones and also talk a bit about our research. So as we know, the deadly quartet, the metabolic syndrome consists of uh, hypertension, glucose intolerance uh, or insulin resistance, and that's diabetes, dyslipidemia, high triglycerides, decreased HDL, and obesity. So basically, if it includes three or more of the following manifestations, and, and the obesity, actually, they do it by waist circumference. So if your waist is greater than 102 centimeters circumference, which is basically about 40 to 43 inches, then that's a problem. And uh, dyslipidemia is either HDL less than one or, or high triglycerides greater than 1.7, and any BP greater than 130 over 85. So this is the map from the uh, uh, Government of Canada website looking at the obesity rates in Canada. And overall, it's about a 23% rate. The United States is around 30 to 32%, so we're actually quickly approaching and catching up to them. Luckily, we here in BC uh, do have still the lowest obesity rates in Canada, but, uh, and we're also below the, the average too, but it still it has risen quite a bit in the last two decades. So in the US, there is the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. So there's been lots of studies looking at metabolic syndrome and stones, but I'm going to examine on some of the big uh, epidemiologic studies where they've had, you know, 30, 40,000 patients. So this is almost 34,000 men, women, and children who they followed from 1988 to 1994. They diagnosed metabolic syndrome if any three of these five things were present. So it was hypertension with 130 over 85 uh, BP, diabetes or insulin resistance, uh, obesity, looking at a waist circumference greater than uh, 102 centimeters or 88 centimeters in women. Elevated triglycerides or decreased HDL. So looking at these 34,000 men, women, and children and following them for almost seven years, they found that the overall uh, incidence of stone disease was about 4.7%. Now, if you had metabolic syndrome, your odds ratio of, of getting a stone was twice as much. It was 2.13. So 8% of, uh, of those with stones had metabolic syndrome. Uh, excuse me, if you had metabolic syndrome, you have an 8% chance of getting it versus 4% 4, 4 with metabolic syndrome. And uh, basically, they also found that the stones, too, were associated with uh, things like uh, gout, and which we, was already well known, as well as thiazide diuretics and allopurinol. Now, we don't know. This is a... a, a observational study, but we don't know whether why these patients were on thiazides or allopurinol. Were they on it for gout and were they on it for hypertension? Because as you know, thiazide and allopurinol are also used to treat stone disease. So perhaps they were already on these drugs for the treatment of stone disease and that's why it was, it was more elevated. Now when you look at the number of factors of the metabolic syndrome traits that they had, the more traits that you had, the more likely you were to have a kidney stone. So if you just had obesity, that was one thing, but if you had obesity, hypertension, and diabetes, and uh, dyslipidemia, then your risk went up and you had the greatest risk there. In fact, the odds ratios go up between uh, having no metabolic syndrome traits around zero being one, and if you have all five traits or four traits, it goes up to 3.85. 
So it's quite a bit higher the more the traits that you have. Now how about just weight on its own? Eric Taylor and Gary Curhan have, uh, are, are two well-known names in stone disease and look at epidemiology. They looked and saw, sought out to see if weight, weight gain, BMI, or waist circumference were associated with kidney stones. They looked at three populations. It was the, um, a health professional's follow-up study, which consists of about 46,000 men between the ages of 40 to 75, and then the Nurses' Health Study 1 and Nurses' Health Study 2. So the Nurses' Health Study 1 obviously start, started earlier, so now they are older women and more mature data set, and NHS 2 is about 116,000 women. So this almost 250,000 patients were followed, and over a 46-year follow-up period, they actually found there was about 40, uh, 4,800 incident kidney stones. With men, if your weight was greater than 100 kilograms, you had an increased risk of getting a kidney stone. If your weight was less than 68 kilograms, you had a decreased risk. And for women, this was actually even more pronounced, uh, both in the younger and the older women. It was almost two times the risk if you were, if you were obese. Now, this is also linked to an increase in uric acid stones as well, as well as struvite stones. So men and older women, uh, as well as younger women, had increased risk of, oh sorry, men and older women had increased risk of stones if they also gained weight during this time. So if you started skinny, then gained weight, you also had an increased risk of stones. If your BMI was greater than 30, that was a, a, a big difference. And the waist circumference, again, greater than 43 inches or, less, or greater than 40 in women. And again, same thing. The fatter you are, the more likely you are to have kidney stones. So on the, on the left is the relative risk. And for the BMI greater than 30, you certainly were at an increased risk for getting, for getting kidney stones. So looking at the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey database, uh, this is another study. This is basically the relative risk of stones if you have diabetes. With men, it wasn't so much of a difference, but with younger women, it was actually a big difference. You had a 1.6 relative risk of getting a kidney stone. With older women, it was uh, slightly lower, probably just due to the, to, to the age. Conversely, if you already uh, uh, had a stone but didn't, wasn't diagnosed with diabetes, you actually were at increased risk of developing diabetes. So the stone came first and then the diabetes came. Now what kind of stones do they have? Of all the diabetics, 34% of them had uric acid, of all the diabetics with stones, 34% of them had uric acid stones. Of all the non-diabetics, only six of those uh, uh, six percent of those patients had uric acid stones, so there's certainly a, a disparity there. And again, the same thing went with obesity. If your BMI was greater than 30, you were more likely to have uric acid stones than if you were a, a normal weight. So why do obesity and diabetes result in uric acid stones? And I think we all know this. And the reason why is you get actually defective ammonia genesis. And uh, ammonia basically is a great buffer in the urine. It will take up that extra hydrogen ion to make it into ammonium and therefore preventing it from hooking up to uric acid. However, if you don't produce as much of this NH3, then this acid is gonna go over to this reaction more. And remember the PKA or the pH where the 50% uh, of the uh, uric acid is soluble versus crystal is around 5.5. So any urine pH less than 5.5 will result in more uric acid stones. In fact, low urine pH is a feature of the metabolic syndrome. And this is uh, more work out of the uh, University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas. And they took 148 patients. These are not stone patients. These are just patients with the metabolic syndrome. And the higher the BMI was, the lower their urine pH was. And in fact, it was a degree of insulin resistance that was the most predictive. And just like stones, the more metabolic syndrome features you have, the lower your urine pH is. So this basically just goes to show that if you have diabetes, hypertension, and obesity, it's not just you're getting kidney stones, it's a whole systemic manifestation where there's an acid-base dysfunction as well as some renal dysfunction as well that will predispose you to getting kidney stones and more likely uric acid stones. So I'd like to change gears just a little bit and talk about treatment. We all know that shockwave lithotripsy is one of the mainstays of therapy for treating kidney stones since the 1980s. And there's been a lot of literature looking at whether or not there's uh, uh, increased diabetes rates or hypertension rates afterwards. One of, the ones that, one of the articles that garnered a lot of attention was back in 2006. This is from the Mayo Clinic from Joe Segura's work, and Amy Cranbeck, who was a, a resident at the time, is now staff there. Um, in 1985, they treated about, they, they actually contacted 630 patients they treated with their HM3 Dorney lithotripture. 
and they compared them to patients who just passed their stone spontaneously, so didn't get shockwave. 19 years later, they looked at whether or not there was increased hypertension or diabetes. So the odds ratio of getting uh, increased hypertension was 1.47, which was significant. And also, 16.8% of patients had diabetes versus 6.7% of patients who, who uh, didn't have shockwave. And this was uh, so even if they adjusted for BMI. So it wasn't just like they were taking the fatter people and they were getting diabetes. So this sparked a, a, a big uh, debate and a big fear amongst uh, some. Um, they, the, the article and the authors themselves do note that their rate of hypertension was actually higher than the general population. So for the shockwave group, it was actually 46%, and for the control group, it was 44.1%. Not much of a difference, but... Uh, and when you compare that to the general population, which is around 25%, the patients with kidney stones had hypertension. So we know that. So what came first, the shockwave or the hypertension? You know, I argue, and, and a lot of people argue too, that it's probably the fact that they're just taking patients with hypertension, they get kidney stones, and that's what they're looking at. It's not that the shock wave was causal in, in their hypertension and diabetes. When looking at the controls, they didn't send them a questionnaire like they did the, the other patients. It was really just a chart review. That was one of the other shortcomings, although, although this is a very difficult study to perform. And then the last thing is, you know, this is a, a, the HM3 had the largest focal zone of all the lithotripsers that we've ever had. It was about... Uh, uh, 1.5 centimeters by 13 centimeters wide. Is it applicable today to our, uh, our, our very narrow focus um, lithotripters? Obviously, it's different. Some people would argue that it's better to have narrow focus because then you don't uh, hit other things along the blast path. Uh, the trade-off is, though, that the HM3 was a very low power peak intensity, and the ones today now are, are, are a lot higher. So it's unknown what happens to today's lithotripters. There's also been a lot of other literature supporting both sides, but um, these are two of the better ones that I thought. There was no difference in the increase of hypertension or diabetes observed in pe people undergoing shockwave versus ureteroscopy for stones. So we decided to look at the data here, and uh, I'd like to recognize this slew of medical students, and Reza, who's now one of our residents, that was also involved with this, and, and the radiologist, Dr. Uh, Rowley and Dr. Zerowicz, but particularly Dr. Afshar, who was really instrumental in the study because he helped us perform all of the, uh, what I find difficult, statistical analyses. So were patients receiving lithotripsy at our center at increased risk of developing hypertension and diabetes if they were done 20 years ago? And was lithotripsy associated with the development of these diseases? Also, one year, we actually modified the lithotriptor. Did this make a difference at all? So from 19, uh, so basically we mailed questionnaires uh, patients to, to patients who had lithotripsy in 85 and 89. Now, the problem was we couldn't identify patients from 20 years ago who had a stone but didn't have shockwave. Um, we also joked around, too, that we were probably not sure if there was, were people that didn't exist that had stones and didn't get shock because it was uh, such a popular modality then. So we used the unmodified shockwave lithotriptor under general anesthesia. And then in 1988, uh, Dornia came along and modified the lithotriptor to change it to a low pressure twin shock generator. So there would be two shocks. And they actually reduced the intensity so they didn't need to be under general anesthesia anymore. It was just under uh, local sedation instead. So here's our results. The, um, subjects were about the same. There's no difference in age, smoking, or uh, diabetes history to begin with. And we just looked at our BMI relative to the general population. And just as we suspected, because stones are associated with the metabolic syndrome, we did notice that uh, patients that were with stones actually were more likely to be overweight or obese. So overweight is between a BMI of 25 to 30, obese is a BMI greater than 30. And this is relative to the general BC population. So when we get down to the meat of it, what happens with diabetes and hypertension? So diabetes is the one on the left, and hypertension is the one on the right. The only thing we found that was different was that there was a significant difference between males in the uh, unmodified original shock with the tripter compared to the BC population the, uh, in both diabetes and hypertension. Even though females looked like there was a trend towards the same thing, it wasn't statistically significant. And in hypertension, there was no difference at, at, at all. So they were in a univariate analysis, but in a multivariate analysis, when we take all of the risk factors in, into consideration, we didn't show, if you look at diabetes, the p-value was only 0.648. So in a multivariate analysis, this did not bear out. There was no association with getting shockwave with the tripsy or diabetes or causing hypertension. What we did find were the well-known risk factors that we already know about, things like advanced age, family history of diabetes, and an increased BMI. For hypertension, 
a history of smoking was predictive for having uh, hypertension after the, afterwards. So this has just been accepted for uh, publication and uh, a conclusion from our center, at least looking at our patients, is that patients receiving lithotripsy uh, certainly were larger. We already know that. They're already more prone to having hypertension and, and we do know that at least on the a univariate analysis, it was higher than the general population. But uh, certainly having lithotripsy back in 85 to 89 on the Dornier HM3 does not make you uh, have an increased risk of diabetes or hypertension now. Now, what about hypertension and stones? We've talked a little bit about that, but uh, basically if you have 13% uh, of people with, with uh, uh, People with high blood pressure and stones, 13% of them had stones compared to 1% of normal tensives. So we know that if you have high blood pressure, you're predisposed to having stones. That was in a um, uh, Swedish study. In the US, there was a study looking at about over 1.1 million people. People with hypertension had an incidence rate of 10.2% with stones versus only 8.2% of normal tensives. So you had a 20% increased risk with an odds ratio of 1.2. Another study, again with Gary, Gary Curhan, looking at 51,000 men, found that hypertensives had 17% chance of stone and compared to 13%. And most of the time, the stone preceded the diagnosis of hypertension. So this is almost, again, like that ED and coronary artery disease thing where you would get ED about three years on average before getting coronary artery disease. Uh, certainly people who are otherwise healthy and young, you know, should be told to be monitored, make sure they see their family doctor for well checkups, get their uh, lipids and, and, and blood pressure checked on a regular basis because they certainly are at increased risk for developing hypertension. Now hypertension can often lead to cardiovascular disease. How about that? There's also good evidence in the literature as well. So the uh, health professional follow-up study with 40,000 men found there was a 15% increase in risk of heart disease, increased risk of myocardial infarction, angina, and coronary bypass. So certainly the data is out there that if you're, uh, you know, getting a kidney stone, it's not just the kidney stone and, and some other thing you're eating too much uh, spinach and too much chocolate. There's something else going on in your entire body, not just acid base, but also perhaps a vascular disease as well. Let's take it even further. How about if you get renal function, uh, uh, renal dysfunction and end-stage renal disease? This is obviously a lot more uncommon. Uh, the, the French registry says there's about 3.2 cases per million per year of renal dysfunction caused by kidney stones. Most of these are from staghorn calculi and struvite calculi. Looking at the U.S. registry, about 1.2% of those with end-stage renal disease occur from, from stones. Again, looking at the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, if you just looked at GFR, if your BMI was greater than 27, your GFR was actually lower in stone formers than controls. So, and that's just, you know, with heavier people, you get a stone, your kidney's not working as well. That's, that's the, about the bottom line. If, you're, if you were, weren't fat, though, however, there was actually no difference in, 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 the, in the BMI. So, what should we be prescribing to our patient? We should be looking at, this brings back basically us to uh, Borgi's study, which is one of the best quoted studies about looking at different diets for preventing kidney stones. What they did was they did a five-year prospective randomized trial following 60 patients in each arm. They put them on two separate diets. One of them was a normal <coughs> calcium of about 1,200 milligrams a day, reduced animal protein, and reduced sodium. Then they compared that to just one group with low calcium. Instead of 1,200 milligrams, only 400 milligrams. They didn't tell them what to do, didn't tell them anything to do about sodium and protein. So this has been the major criticism of the study is they're changing three factors in one arm and only one factor in the other arm. Which factor is it that's actually doing it? They're, they're, they're stating that the, the normal calcium levels is basically, uh, when, you, when you have low calcium, what ends up happening is you have more recurrent kidney stones. Normal calcium, low protein, low salt results in a lower recurrence risk of stone disease. So the people in the low calcium diet had a higher urinary oxalate, and this makes sense now knowing what we know, because you get less binding in the GI tract. What we tell patients now is to eat oxalate and their calciums together so that they bind in the gut, get excreted in the feces, rather than get absorbed separately in the colon and then meet in the kidney to form a calcium oxalate crystal. People on the normal calcium low protein salt diet had a, a basically decreased their risk by about a half. Again, the main criticism, though, is that apples to oranges, you're changing calcium, uh, protein, and salt What about uh, versus just calcium. What about the other things? So that's been the main criticism. This is, uh, this is things that uh, Dr. Patterson and Dr. Sutton and I have talked about uh, during our stone rounds about recommended daily intake um, for patients. And 
Uh, for calcium, patients should be taking about 1,000 milligrams a day, and we recommend that with meals, and that's in an effort to try and bind any oxalate that they're also ingesting at the same time to reduce any hyperoxaluria levels. Incidentally, this uh, recommended calcium level is also recommended for uh, those with low bone mineral density. So the osteoporosis <coughs> guidelines are about the same as well. And they should be taking about vitamin D. It doesn't have to be at the same time, about 1,000 units daily. Canada Food Health Guidelines recommend about 150 to 225 grams a day. So that's about 8 ounces for the entire day, not just one steak the entire day. So it's certainly a lot lower than we're eating here in North America. And sodium, the recommended daily dose, uh, are the RDA is about 2,400 milligrams a day. But I think for stone formers, I think the lower the better. Just so you know, so you know, if you eat like one of those packet of instant noodles, that's basically half your sodium intake for the entire day, because those are, are anywhere ranging from about 1,000 to 1,200 milligrams a day. Looking at oxalate, uh, spinach is our number one cause of oxalate in our diet. And uh, Dr. Sutton and I were talking as well as with Ryan, we don't really limit oxalate too much. We do limit spinach because it is a very high, uh, and I'll show you some data, but we also tell people just to eat their oxalate with calcium. You're going to have a salad, eat it with cheese, uh, ricotta cheese, even eat your, your, your um, oxalate-containing foods with milk, and that'll really help bind things together and keep it in the gut. Another study by Eric Taylor uh, looked at the um, health professional studies, nurse health studies one and two, and looked at what comprised the majority of oxalate containing foods with these men and women. Number one across all three categories was cooked spinach, followed by number two, raw spinach, and then followed by just in third, uh, potatoes, basically. So spinach and potatoes. If you had more than eight servings of spinach a month, <clears throat> you, had a, you had an elevated relative risk of getting kidney stones. They, however, think that uh, the relative risk from your lowest to highest quintile of oxalate ingestion was actually not great. So here's the, the men, the older women, and the younger women. And number one quintile is basically the lowest amount of oxalate people, that people took versus number f the fifth quintile, which is the highest amount of oxalate they took. So adjust, looking at the relative risk, you go from about 1 to 1.22 in men and 1 to 1.21 in women. But in uh, younger women, it actually didn't make a difference. It was about 1 to about 1.06. So not much of a difference in younger women, but in men and older women, it seemed to make a difference. But the authors still seem to say that dietary oxalate did not play a major role, even though there was almost a 20% increase in getting kidney stones. This is also an, another uh, great study by Taylor and Curhan, where they looked at the DASH-style diet. So the DASH-style diet is the dietary approaches to stopping hypertension. It's a diet that's high in fruits and veggies, so you're going to increase your oxalate by all the green leafy vegetables you're eating, but you're also going to increase your citrate by all the fruits you're eating as well, which hopefully will counteract and provide some beneficial effects. It's moderate and low-fat dairy products, so pretty much um, you're getting between you know, 1,000 to 1,200 milligrams of calcium a day just from diet here, and it's low in animal protein. Okay. So the DASH diet has been effectively shown to lower blood pressure for sure. They did find in these patients, however, that they did have higher urinary oxalate. And that makes sense because you're eating more vegetables. That's fine. But you also have, a, 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 and because of the higher vitamin C from the fruit, which uh, ascorbate gets converted to oxalate, you also get that pathway as well. So they followed those three cohorts, and they did exclude patients with hypertension and uh, diabetes, basically. When you look at the dash to our quintiles, so basically this is, uh, the first quintile is, is essentially um, if, you would, if you don't adhere to the dash diet as much as you do for the fifth quintile. So you're eating more fruits and veggies, it's, it's a lower animal protein diet versus the ones in quintile number five. So the more strictly you adhere to the dash diet, <clears throat> this is the difference between the fifth quintile and the lowest quintile. You reduce your risk by almost about a half in pretty much all categories. And they adjusted this for, for age, for hypertension and diabetes and BMI and everything else. So it was really just the diet that, that was doing this. It wasn't anything else. So the DASH diet showed a reduction in stones in all three cohorts. Increased animal protein uh, equals increased stones in, in men in particularly, not, not in women. And the oxalate, the increased oxalate that you got from vegetables was probably offset by the increase you had in citrate, which you got from the fruit. Or it also could be because the increased calcium that you're taking is binding the oxalate in your gut and then you're excreting it in, in your feces. There's still a question mark about the impact of dietary oxalate and the role that it plays. So what I would think is don't limit oxalate intakes because high oxalates are okay, as the DASH diet has shown, uh, 
eat lots of fruit to keep the citrate, and the, the calcium is really important, and it must be eaten with the oxalate so that they bind together. I often give patients the example that when you eat rhubarb pie with ice cream, you get that chalky taste in your mouth. It's the oxalate coming out of the rhubarb and the calcium coming out of the ice cream, and that's the, the, the affinity for calcium and oxalate is so high, that's the, the crystals that you're feeling in your mouth. Often when you eat spinach too, you'll feel that gritty feeling. That's the oxalate coming out of solution and crystallizing. So low sodium and low animal protein was also a, a, a big thing from the DASH diet as well. Now we've also always told patients that high dietary sodium uh, should be avoided because it worsens hypercalciuria because of the sodium uh, calcium exchanger in, in, in the kidney. Um, Marshall Stoller did an interesting look. He looked at 800 of his patients and looked at the highest quintile versus the lowest quintile of sodium. And what they actually found was that your volume, the, the hypercalciuria was increased in people who had more sodium. And they also found that increased volume was there as well. When they looked at the supersaturation, so the saturation levels of calcium oxalate, the higher your sodium was, actually the lower your supersaturation was. So he said it was actually better for you to have more sodium because of the volume. Basically, you know, uh, we've talked about this in stone rounds. We think that the increased urine volume really just trumps the increased urine calcium. But we just still wouldn't recommend a high sodium diet to patients. And I think as a public uh, service announcement, I think the lower uh, salt for just getting rid of hypertension, and that's been linked to obesity as well, will be huge for them in the long run, not just, not just for preventing stones. So um, to conclude my part here, so a kidney stone in an otherwise healthy patient may be their sentinel event. You know, often, particularly uric acid stones, when I see someone younger who gets a big uric acid stone, uh, I often tell them, I say, look, this is often more commonly found in people with diabetes. You should really get your sugars checked regularly and make sure you get your blood pressure checked. Also, in other people who are otherwise healthy and get a kidney stone, they should make sure they get routine follow-up with their family doctors. I've also shown here that there's uh, good evidence, especially from our center as well as some others, that shockwave lithotripsy is not related to causing diabetes or, or hypertension. And patients should be counseled about the fact that it's not just a kidney stone, they need to look at their, their health in general. We've shown that the diet, uh, the DASH diet, the di dietary approaches to stop hypertension is a good diet and make sure that the people stay replete with calcium with about 1,000 milligrams a day eaten with their meals. Okay. So I'm not going to take any questions now. Um, I'm going to introduce Dirk, and he's going to talk a bit about uh, bacteria and in our gut. So Dirk is a PhD in, micro in, in microbiology who did his PhD at University of Western Ontario and has been here for the last three years doing his uh, postdoc in our lab. Basically, he's been running the lab, and we're hoping to uh, get him on staff in, in, a, in a principal investigator role at the Stone Center. So I'll turn it over to Dirk. Thank you very much. So uh, as Ben already uh, just mentioned, I'm just going to spend a few minutes talking to you about the importance of uh, the gut microbiome in uh, human disease and, and the potential role that it may have in uh, causing stone disease and, and what we're doing about it in terms of, you know, uh, what we're going to look into uh, in our lab. Um, so, just to give you an idea, the human body harbors approximately 10 times more microbial cells than, than human cells. And the majority of these are, are found in the colon. Now, to put this into, into more numbers, the, the human gut microbiome consists of at least 1,800 uh, genera and anywhere between 15 and 36,000 bacterial species. And the importance of the colon to host health was first noted by Hippocrates way back when, uh, when he said that death sits uh, in the bowel. So the human gut is, is the mo one of the most densely populated ecosystem, and uh, bacteria are the most dominant um, um, species present. And more than 90% of the bacteria phylotypes uh, that are present in the gut belong to the groups bacteroides and uh, firmicutes. Now, if you were to look at uh, the, all of the bacteria in the gut at the genomic level, the number of enzymes that uh, they encode um, vastly exceeds that of the human genome. And specifically, the uh, bacterial genome encodes biochemical pathways that humans have not evolved. So this statement right here indicates the importance of the gut microbiome to human health because their presence uh, allows us to, or yeah, breaks down certain components that we would not otherwise be able to break down, which in turn allows us to utilize certain uh, compounds that we would not otherwise be able to uh, utilize. So what is the role of the commensal gut microbiome? Well, the major role is to break down complex carbohydrates, 
um, which are undigested <coughs> before they get to the colon, as well as host-derived glycans. And through bacterial fermentation, they form short-chain fatty acids such as butyrate, acetate, propionate, and, and lactate. And these are then taken up um, by the host in the gut. Collectively, uh, these short-chain fatty acids act to lower luminal pH, which makes a more favorable environment for a bacterial survival. Uh, increased bacterial biomass because uh, bacterial fermentation generates energy that allows the bacteria to thrive and grow. And most importantly, especially to uh, stone disease, um, the short-chain fatty acids contribute to uh, epithelial barrier health, and I'll get into that uh, in a moment. So let's look uh, briefly at what happens when things go awry uh, in the gut. So one of the diseases uh, where significant perturbations in uh, GI microbiota were found was irritable bowel disease, and this is quite recent, actually. And I, basically what they found in these patients was that, that the gut microbiome had decreased members of the bacteroidae and lacno, lacnospiraceae groups. If I can get my cursor here. And you, you can see the control groups here uh, versus the IBD subset here over on this side. In fact, several bacterial species that were underrepresented in these patients were related to butyrate uh, producing bacteria. And butyrate is actually one of the uh, important uh, short chain fatty acids produced in the colon uh, because it's an important source of energy for colonic uh, epithelial cell growth and differentiation. Um, which, of course, is important in contributing to the tight junction formation between the cells, which promotes uh, bacteria, uh, um, excuse me, barrier function. Now, the barrier function becomes important because it is actually, in part, what regulates the movement of, of ions and compounds across uh, from the lumen of the gut into the um, systemic circulation. Another disease state that's uh, recently been associated with uh, perturbation in the gut microbiota is uh, obesity. And uh, the initial link um, between microbial ecology and obesity was made in leptin-deficient mice, and the phenotype in those is that, that they're uh, obese. And what was found in these, uh, these mice was that uh, their gut microbiota had increased members of the group's firmicutes and fewer members of the bacteroidae group compared uh, to the wild type. Now, essentially, what this resulted in was differing, uh, different levels of short-chain fatty acid synthesis uh, of the obese versus uh, the, the, the lean mice. Um, at the genetic level, this uh, in turn translated an enrichment in the genes involved in energy extraction from the food. And this is represented in the, in the second graph where the uh, total amount of energy left in the feces in, in the obese versus the normal mice was uh, significantly lower. A distinct or sp a specific link uh, between uh, uh, perturbations in the, in the gut microbiome and obesity uh, was shown in the last experiment, which essentially um, found that um, uh, germ-free uh, mice that were given uh, bacterial load from obese um, mice showed a significant increase in weight over a two-week period. Uh, compared to normal animals on the same diet. So, I mean, that, that in itself is, is quite a significant finding. Um, so, I know what you're wondering is, yeah, well, okay, mice is one thing, but what about humans? Well, as it turns out, um, humans also, uh, well, obese uh, individuals, also have lower numbers of uh, the bacteroid eat, um, bacterial groups uh, in their gut uh, microbiome and also increased numbers of firmicutes compared to lean individuals. And these, this is the obese subset here and the lean individuals on this side. Now interestingly, when obese uh, individuals were placed on a low carbohydrate or low fat diet, the number of firmicutes increased over time, as you can see here, um, as the weight of the individuals uh, actually decreased. So not only uh, does this uh, a finding show a direct link between uh, the, the gut microbiome uh, and obesity in that the microbi microbial community in the gut affects the amount of energy that's extracted from the diet, but it also shows that changing diet can also show, uh, excuse me, change the gut microbiome 
So, so what about stone disease? Well, over the past few years, there's been a big deal made about this uh, particular bacterium called Oxalobacter formigenes, uh, which is a gram-negative uh, anaerobe, and its sole carbon source uh, is oxalate. Now, basically what was found is that colonization of the gut with this particular bacterium depends on the health status. And they looked at IBD patients, CF patients, and um, stone disease patients, and what they found is that these individuals, or, or less of these individuals, harbor this particular bacterium in their gut. So, as far as stone disease is concerned, what does Oxalobacter do to decrease the risk of stone disease? Well, as you're, uh, I'm sure, aware of, oxalate reaches the systemic circulation in, in two ways, either through the food that we ingest or through the production of the liver uh, via the glycolate pathway. Well, oxalobacter formigenes acts in two different ways. First, it acts to degrade the dietary oxalate in the colon and prevents it from being absorbed into the systemic circulation. And as uh, we've recently shown in our lab, um, it also has the ability to trigger secretion from the systemic circulation back into the gut uh, and, and uh, use, colon, uh, excuse me, use oxalate um, as its carbon source. So now this becomes particularly important to the hyperoxaluric patient as this is potentially a treatment for this uh, uh, serious disease. So now this is just looking at a single bacterial species though. I, I'm talking to you about uh, you know, the entire gut microbiome. So, so what about the gut microbiome as, as a whole? Well, as you've hopefully learned so far from, from this talk, is that, that the gut microbial composition affects short-chain fatty acid composition uh, in the gut. And I briefly touched on this. Uh, short-chain fatty acids um, affect tight junctions and, and hence the permeability of the colonic epithelial cells. Now, this becomes important in, in paracellular transport of ions and compounds across the uh, gut epithelial layer. Now, what's been found is that physiological concentrations of butyrate uh, increases transepithelial resistance, um, while higher concentrations than, than physiological uh, actually decrease it. Now, what we've uh, recently shown uh, in Ising Chamber experiments in our lab is, is that oxalate, appears, uh, oxalate transport appears to be mostly passive and uh, paracellular. So as you can imagine then, it's quite possible that uh, short-chain fatty acid concentrations in the gut uh, affecting uh, uh, tight junctions and, and uh, permeability may also have an effect on oxalate transport and absorption in the gut. Another way in which short-chain fatty acids uh, can uh, increase the risk for stone disease is by affecting ions such as sodium and chloride um, absorption in the colon. And, and uh, Ben just briefly touched upon uh, the, the, the high sodium diet, where increased uh, sodium in the circulation actually increases the risk of hypercalciuria, which increases the risk of uh, uh, stone disease. So again, uh, as it turns out, short-chain fatty acid absorption in the gut uh, by specific uh, receptor mechanisms is actually linked to sodium and chloride absorption. Um, so increased uptake of, of short-chain fatty acids may actually lead to increased sodium concentrations, uh, which in turn down the chain may lead to uh, uh, increased risk of uh, calcium oxalate stone disease. So now that I've told you all about this, just to, just want to give you a brief uh, overlook of what we're doing or planning to do in our lab to look into this uh, gut microbiome role in stone disease. So one of the questions we're asking ourselves is whether uh, uh, recurrent stone formation can be linked to an abnormal gut microbiome, as we're seeing with IBD patients and uh, obese patients. And incidentally, uh, the risk of stone disease is increased in this uh, subset of patients as well. And for this, we are actually collaborating with uh, Dr. Colin Collins and uh, Dr. Stefan LeBien at the Laboratory of Advanced Genome Analysis uh, at the Prostate Center. And essentially, what we're going to look at is, is whether the gut microbiome differs uh, between stone patients or recurrent stone patients versus uh, normal controls. Another question we're asking is, is the gut microbiome a symbiotic environment um, that works together to break down oxalate? Because the question with oxalobacter has come up is, how can a single bacterial species in 15 to 36,000 different bacterial species that are present in the gut have such a profound effect? Well, do they work together or is it in fact just a single bacterial 
type of bacterium that's doing this. And uh, we're also trying to understand colonization of oxalobacter formigenes, and currently we're working on developing a serotyping scheme that will allow us to identify the different uh, uh, types or subspecies, if you will, of oxalobacter that colonize uh, individuals to try and improve long-term colonization and treatment because the current treatment available with uh, oxalobacter is only short-lived because colonization cannot be uh, maintained for long periods of time. So the take-home message from my part uh, is then that, that the gut microbiome affects several disease states and, and there's also the potential that, that it has an effect on stone disease. And uh, research at the Stone Center here is, is currently looking into this.